Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our program this wonderful Thursday evening. Uh, we regularly fold events like this in the Independent Policy Forum uh, on a regular basis that uh, feature uh, excellent speakers in the form of lectures and debates and seminars and so forth. And our program tonight is certainly a topical one. Uh, it's called Why Government Fails But Free Individuals Succeed with the esteemed journalist John Stossel, author of the new book, No They Can't. No They Can't What? I guess he'll, say, he'll tell us. <laughs> it's No They Can't, Why Governments Do Fail but, but Individuals <laughs> Succeed. For those of, new, of you new to the Independent Institute, hopefully you got a packet when you registered. You'll find information about our program. The Institute, in a nutshell, is a nonprofit public policy research organization. We sponsor studies of major economic and social issues. Our ambition is to advance the ideas that can advance peaceful, prosperous, and free societies. Um, we produce many books. Uh, this is also our quarterly journal, The Independent Review, which uh, we hope everyone here will be, you're probably all subscribing already, I'm sure. <laughs> but you're welcome to subscribe. Uh, one of the books I wanted to point out that's listed in a sheet in your packet uh, called Books on Liberty is a book coming out uh, soon called Priceless. It's by the economist John Goodman. Uh, and the subtitle of the book is Curing the Healthcare Crisis. And, uh, John is an old friend, and this is certainly a very important issue that our speaker tonight is very well aware of. And of course, that book and all of our books make exceptional material for documentaries each and every Thursday night on the Fox Business Channel. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to point out in the packet, you'll find a sheet about the summer seminars that we organize each summer for high school and college students. It's called the Challenge of Liberty Seminars. Uh, they're one-week programs which provide really an exceptional education for students on the ideas of liberty and to sort of see through the fog and spin of public debate and public policy. We certainly live in strange times. Uh, government spending and power, I think we would generally agree has reached new heights in almost every aspect of our lives. Yet, and as governments become ever more insolvent and predatory, we hear the clamor for even more spending and power as solutions to the government failures of the past. It's laughable, and yet it's very disturbing, and actually it's cruelly disturbing. Trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, wars and more wars, mandates, controls, edicts, cronyism, corruption, and untold other follies are just being heaped one on another. For example, on March 16th, and based on President Truman's executive order, the Defense Pro uh, Production Act of 1950, President Obama issued his executive order, National Defense Resources Preparedness. Some of you may not have heard about this. What this executive order does is it sets forth his claimed authority in the name of national defense to unilaterally take control of all aspects of the economy, including transportation, food production, energy, <coughs> health care, labor, water resources, construction, and quote, all other material services and facilities, unquote. Meanwhile, and in bold contrast, we have our speaker tonight. <laughs> and our speaker is one of the jewels, in my opinion, of popular culture, of understanding public policy, and certainly journalism. He has won many Emmy Awards. He's a Peabody Award winner. Uh, his new book, No They Can, as I mentioned, in it he wants Americans to wake up and look at the facts, discard the idea of government mothering, and live as free people. We're hence delighted to have John back with us again. We had him here a number of years ago and he's here to discuss a few of the foibles that we're facing. John? Thank you, 
thanks for coming. The the title, uh, No They Can't, is obviously a response to that frenzy of, yes, we can, from the last election. And my concern that people turn to politics for that, that people want to just follow somebody. And it was pretty heavy with Obama. Uh, McCain had a lot of it, too. I interviewed people who McCain was going to fix the world. Uh, Obama was over the top. He, he even himself at one point said, elect me. It will bring us to the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and our planet began to heal. <laughs> I mean, that arrogance is out there. Now, David talked about the fog and the spin that, that is out there. It's also, the, and the theme of this book is its instinct. I think it's instinct that people say when there's a problem, there ought to be a law. Now, normal people do. Maybe you're different. You're the minority here who get liberty. But normal people, and I myself, because it took me many years of cheering for regulation. That's when I won those Emmy Awards David mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't win them now. <laughs> it's instinct to say there ought to be a law. I mean, one example, after 9-11, we were scared. I was probably more scared than you because I live in Manhattan. And when the government said, oh, we got to take over airline security, nobody batted an eye. Uh, you may remember at the time it was done by private contractors supervised by government, but they were minimum wage, they weren't great. So we got the TSA. I mean, Tom Daschle said, you can't professionalize if you don't federalize. <laughs> you grunt at that. But the Senate voted 100 to 0 then to create the TSA. So how's that working out for us? <laughs> You know, we don't know if they've made us safer. The, the underwear bomber and the shoe bomber were not caught by the TSA. They were caught by the passengers. Um, the TSA now spends 10 times what the previous private screeners spent. And in one city, th there are private contractors. The law allows an airport, a city, to say, we want to opt out of the TSA. We want to go to private contractors, and San Francisco did. Your city of all places, well, almost. Um, so I don't know what your experience is there, but our producer who went there said he found people who said things like, wow, this, these screeners are friendlier, and the line moves more quickly. Yes, no? Good. <laughs> and also, they're better at their jobs in terms of safety because the TSA did its own undercover experiment. They try to sneak in fake contraband, fake pipe bomb or something, and the screeners in San Francisco were much more likely to find it than screeners in Los Angeles, than the government screeners. So why? Why is the private screening company better? Well, you know, because his own money's on the line. If he does a bad job, he can get fired. Nobody ever fires the government. They don't fire themselves. Also, he can get rich if he gets a good reputation. Other cities may hire him. So what does he do? He does things like run contests, March Madness contests for his screeners, he calls it. You can make up to $2,000 if you're better at unpacking and packing luggage and better at uh, being nice to people and better at identifying people on a test. And these screeners, they're proud. They get a kick out of their job. They, unlike the sort of going through the motions government workers, they have an excitement to their job. So they're better. So now other cities have noticed this, and more than a dozen have asked the TSA if they can opt out, because the law requires them to ask permission. One is the airport manager at the airport outside Glacier National Park in Montana, where of course, in summertime, there are many more people there. And in winter, it's kind of dead. Because who wants to go to Montana in the winter? And the TSA, being a government agency, one size fits all, has the staffing levels the same the whole time. So in the summer, there are long lines. And in the winter, TSA stands for its initials. Thousands standing around. <laughs> 
<coughs> all the, she and all these other airport managers asked to opt out. What does the TSA do? It simply doesn't respond for a year. And then a couple months ago, it finally says, we reject all these applications. What's the reason? One sentence explanation. We do not think this is advantageous to the federal government. <coughs> Wouldn't McDonald's like to say that to Burger King? <laughs> now, why won't they do it? Why won't they say, gee, these guys are better? Of course, because they're now a bureaucratic empire. And to s let others compete would be to give up power. And Nobody much likes to do that, but in government, you get to enforce that, and so they do. Central planning appeals to people. This is another thing we fight about, as I say. It's not just fog and spin. I think it's instinct. There's some sense that life's complex, and uh, you know, I can't get my brain around how you design a sewage treatment plant myself. So we want the smartest guy in the room, the one there you go. <laughs> the one who went to Harvard to direct the economy. This makes sense to people. Where does this come from? Well, I think it comes from our history, our parents. When we were little kids, mommy and daddy ran our lives. That made us feel safe. And evolution. For thousands and thousands of years, our ancestors lived in little tribes, clans, 50, 100, 200 people at the most, and you had to follow the clan leader. If you didn't, if you harvested the fruit at the wrong time when he said you shouldn't or something, you might have died and not given birth to you. So we're programmed to follow the clan leader, and now he's our clan leader, and it makes sense to people. We're not wired to see that these impersonal market forces could solve problems. The invisible hand is just not intuitive to people. Or I like the way Hayek put it, the spontaneous order. The way I like to make people think about that is to say, imagine a skating rink if you had never heard of a skating rink. You're the regulators, and I'm a greedy businessman. I want to introduce here in Oakland a new form of recreation, ice on the ground, and people are going to strap sharp blades to their feet and zip around and old and young are going to go in every direction. No way, you'd say. you got to have a skating police or stoplights or something. And yet, we know it basically works. Uh, it's a spontaneous order. But if you hadn't seen it, you might have rejected it. People say government has to, you know, even the people who acknowledge that maybe free markets are okay for the simple stuff, movies, music, computers, cell phones, when it comes to the complicated stuff or where our lives are at stake, you've got to have this brilliant central planner because uh, education, health care. The New Yorker had an article about health care and they were, the doctors were talking. These free market people, on the way to the hospital, when you're having a heart attack, you're going to start doing research on which hospital or doctors are better at treating the heart attack and who's cheaper. What a joke. Who thinks up this stuff? Well, Adam Smith, for one, but they don't understand that. <laughs> Education. The parents don't understand what the curricula should be or who's a good teacher. We need people with education, PhD degrees to plan this for people. And this makes sense. This intuitively makes sense. My way of answering it is to say, no, that, that you don't have to be an expert for the market to work its magic. It always is better. As an example, take cars. Do you understand why one is better than another, why safer, better engineering? I assume most of you are not automotive engineers. I sure don't. But compare the worst you can buy here in California with the best the planned economies could produce, the expert central planners, the best they could do was this. <laughs> Some of you younger people may not know, this was the pride of the Soviet bloc. This was the East German car, the Trabant. And there were others, the Yugo, they were all bad. But I mean, this was made by the East Germans. They were rocket scientists, and yet <laughs> this car was awful. You had to put the oil and gas in separately and shake the car to mix them together. <laughs> and when the Berlin Wall went down, the Trabant disappeared. <clears throat> so why? Why could their best not compete against our mediocre stuff? 
because not everybody has to be an expert for the free market to work. You just need a few car buffs or a few people who read the car magazines. And through word of mouth in an open society, the good news and the bad news spread. The good companies grow, the bad ones atrophy. The free market will protect everybody, even the ignorant. But it's not intuitive, and so government grows. And they have lots of evidence they can point to. Look how we've made your life better. The head of OSHA under President Clinton was fond of showing this chart. Now, OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And they created it after people were getting killed in factories. So they said, this is unacceptable. We have to have standards. Now they have a rule book, rule book this thick. Nobody really understands what's in it. The lawyers can argue about it for years. Uh, but it clearly makes life safer. Look how many lives they've saved. This doesn't even count how many injuries they've prevented. Thank God for government. Except a researcher checked out what happened before OSHA was created, and that reveals more. <laughs> <laughs> Government's like somebody who gets in front of a parade and pretends it led the parade. <laughs> Things were getting better on their own. Now, why does this happen? This happens because in a free society, things get better. People get smarter. When someone gets injured, you take a corrective step so they don't get injured next time. As we get wealthier, we care more about safety. Wealthier is healthier. And even the selfish company, the greedy company that, that killed its worker is reluctant to keep killing workers because it costs money to retrain the new staff. <laughs> Free market makes it better, too. Government isn't needed. We, know, we saw this for the war on poverty. Lyndon Johnson said the Great Society is going to end poverty. Uh, and they created welfare. And the poverty rate went down for the first five years. And then, as you know, it stopped. It's been plateaued, going up and down ever since, partly because we taught people to be dependent. And we taught women, don't get married. Get the guy out of the house. Your check will be smaller. You won't get a check. But they could at least say, hey, the poverty rate dropped sharply those first five years. Think how many lives we improved. Except here, too, somebody went to before welfare was created, and the slope of the line was already dropping. People were lifting themselves out of poverty. <coughs> Government stopped the progress. Government constantly stops progress, and yet it grows. Thomas Jefferson said it's the natural progress of things for government to grow and liberty to yield. And that's sure what's happened. Here's the graph of spending since the beginning of the republic. The big blips are for the world wars. Here it is averaged over 10 years, so you smooth that out. But for the most, for the first 150 years of America, government was less than a few percent of GDP. And we grew fastest then. The most progress was made then. Then came the Great Society, and it starts to go up, and Bush and Obama made it much worse. And now, as you know, we're on this unsustainable course, mostly because of Medicare and because of my generation. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, I rudely refuse to die. <laughs> When FDR started Social Security, most people didn't even live to age 65. Now we live, on average, to 78. And you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Probably rampant inflation, because they're not going to stiff us, because we vote. You young people are screwed, because you don't vote as much. You know, I, David would know more about what's likely to happen when, when this blows up. But they scream at any cut. Any proposal for a cut, Paul Ryan's timid cuts are social Darwinism. <laughs> Why is America doing pretty well? Uh, I have a charity where I try to, and some of you have seen these videos that uh, teachers would write me and say, we taped your show on free markets and kids had never heard of such things. I played it in the classroom. We had a great discussion. Or I wish I'd taped it. Can I buy it from ABC? And, and they wouldn't sell it. So uh, I started a charity where we give it to teachers free. And 
one of the more popular ones is one where I ask the kids, why is America prosperous? I ask high school students, and they have no clue. But eventually somebody says, oh, it's because America's a democracy. And uh, we're a relatively new country, and we have natural resources. And I say, India's a democracy. India has natural resources, but they're poor. They say, India's overpopulated. I can answer, well, actually, the population density of India is the same as that of New Jersey. New Jersey's doing OK. Or not, depending on your <laughs> perspective. You're here in California. And what about Hong Kong? This is Milton Friedman's insight that Hong Kong has no natural resources. It's just a rock and no democracy. It had uh, the British rulers and now the communist Chinese. And yet Hong Kong went from poverty to wealth in just 50 years. Third world to first world. Why? Because they had the ingredients that make a country prosperous. Economic freedom and rule of law. Now, you know, rule of law is important. That means that your personal property, your personal self is protected. Uh, the worst places to live are the places that don't have rule of law. They have a corrupt judiciary and nobody wants to build a factory because the dictator may take the whole factory or, neighbor just, or your neighbor may just steal whatever you make. So you need rule of law. And Hong Kong had that. The British rulers enforced that. They kept people from robbing each other, or taking each other's stuff. And then they sat around and drank tea. <laughs> Benign neglect. That's the road to prosperity. Hong Kong, free people then made themselves rich. So we know what works. We could have it for the whole world, and yet 7 billion people on Earth, 2 billion live on a buck or two a day. Only less than 1 million live anywhere near to our level of wealth because they don't understand this process of capitalism. And yet, capitalism is vilified in every university I've visited and every newsroom I've been in. People just don't like business. So what's that about? I mean, somebody came up to me on the street in New York and said, are you John Stossel? Yes. I hope you die soon. <laughs> And I'm trying to figure out why they're so angry at me. And at first, I thought it's because they consider me a conservative, because I'm the different one. And, and uh, where I live, that's like being a child molester. <laughs> but I'm not a conservative. I'm a libertarian. I think homosexuality is just fine. I think drugs should be legal. I think sex work, prostitution should be legal. I think adults should be able to do anything that's peaceful. I'm a libertarian, and yet they hate me. I would think the liberals would be okay with that, but they still hate me because I'm a consumer reporter defending business, and they hate business. So why do they hate business? I'm thinking, well, maybe it's because they go to schools where their university professors were furious that their slightly stupider roommates went into business and now make more than they do, and they're envious. Um, the wealth disparity in America is big, and that makes people uncomfortable. It's a byproduct of freedom. If you're free, some people will be much richer than others. But that makes some people envious, some people hate. So I thought that was the reason people hate business. But then I thought about old Europe and the kings and queens, and they were a million times richer than the average person. And they weren't, yet they weren't hated. They were revered, but people hated the bourgeoisie, gave them that nasty name. They hated the very people they needed to sell them stuff to make their lives better. What's that about? And I've come to think it goes back to this intuition. My book is divided into here's what intuition tells you, here's what reality has taught me. Intuition says that business is a zero-sum game, that if, some, if Bill Gates makes, a lot, makes 50 billion, we have 50 billion less. And it's like this, this pie. He takes a big piece. We always hear about the, what's your share of the pie? Well, he got a big piece. We must have less. But business doesn't work that way because business is voluntary. Can you give me that water, David? Um, 
Only two ways to do things in life. Thank you. Right? Voluntary or force. Most of life is voluntary, the best of life. But government is force, legal force. And we need some government, as I said. But the best of life is the voluntary part, and that includes business. So that means it's not like there's this pie and Gates take a, takes a big hunk. He had to bake thousands of new pies to get rich. The way you get rich in a free market is to serve your customers well. I mean, you see it in every transaction. The transaction doesn't happen unless you both think you win. You see it when you, in the weird double thank you moment when you buy a cup of coffee. I mean, you give her the buck, she gives you the coffee, say, thank you, thank you. Why do you both say thank you? Because you both win. I wanted the coffee more than I wanted the buck. She wanted the buck more than she wanted the coffee. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't have gone down. That's why free markets create wealth. We all have to win or it doesn't happen. It's not a perfect system. There will always be cheating. There will be Enrons and Bernie Madoffs. But in a 15, 16 trillion dollar economy, it's pretty impressive how rare that is. It's rare because you win by serving your customers well. But people don't get that. Economic freedom creates prosperity. Now, economists focus on the prosperous part of that statement. But the freedom part is just as important. My objection to bloated government is not just because it makes us poor. It's a moral objection. When government takes away our choices, takes away our control over our own lives, it makes us less. Government crowds out good things. It cuts the tendrils of civil society. It sucks the life out of people. That's why when politicians say, can I have that? Yes, we can. I want people to go to state capitals and hold up this sign. <laughs> That's my dream, that the, tea par the new Tea Party will be doing that. Now, Frederick Hayek said, uh, and my goal through this book is to teach people that, uh, Frederick Hayek said that the curious task of economics is to teach men how little they know about what they imagine they can design. I'm still looking forward to saying that to Bill O'Reilly. My job here is to teach you how little you know about what you imagine you can design. <laughs> I will do that someday. <laughs> still, saying that government can't solve problems is not, the, not saying we can't. We, as individuals and groups of indi individuals, accomplish all kinds of miracles. But we don't really pay attention to it, but clubs, community groups, groups like this, like the Independent Institute, families working toward common goals do wonderful things. Greedy, profit-seeking businesses do it, too. I mean, they've given us, what, Lipitor, robotic limbs, hip replacements, computers, iPhones, flush toilets, air conditioning. We don't even think about it. We just use it. We don't think where we got it. Poor people now have access to food, entertainment, shelter, travel, information, lifespans that exceed what kings had a century ago. But we don't think about where it came from. We just go to the supermarket and take it for granted that they have 30,000 on average products on the shelves and they're unbelievably cheap and they're open all the time and the aisles are nice and well lit and pleasant and they rarely poison us. <laughs> At the beginning of the Obamacare discussion, the Detroit Medical Center proudly announced, we're going to use barcodes to keep track of patient records. We're the first big medical center in the country. Yay, aren't we great? And it was good that they did. But supermarkets did it for Coke and candy 30 years ago. <laughs> Why so late for health care? Because governments poisoned health care with tax deductions for employer paid health insurance and stuff like that. We take it for granted that we can go to a foreign country, stick a piece of plastic in the wall, and cash will come out. And that we can give the same piece of plastic to a total stranger, and he'll rent you a car for a week. And when you get home to California, they'll have the accounting visa or MasterCard correct to the penny. And if they don't, you get mad and complain. 
government can't even count the votes accurately. <laughs> and yet they want government to run health care. Government fails, but individuals succeed. Thank you for fighting for that freedom that made America possible. Thanks very much.